Hi, everyone. Uh, if you haven't seen me before, uh, up here giving instruction several times. My name is Sydney Ager, and I'm the public programs producer here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's poetry reading in response to anti-Semitism with Ruth ben Giat. Here at the museum, we are dedicated to the crucial mission of educating our diverse community about Jewish life and heritage before, during, and after the Holocaust. As part of that mission, our programs illuminate the stories of survivors, broader histories of hate and anti-Semitism, stories of resistance against injustice, and more. Thank you so much for joining us both in person and virtually. Um, we hope that if you are here in person, that you will uh, get to see our current exhibitions, and that if you are attending virtually, that you will have the chance to come to the museum if you are able to do so. Um, our current exhibitions include Courage to Act, Rescue in Denmark, which is uh, right behind me, um, and is the museum's first exhibition for visitors ages nine and up. Courage to Act tells the story of how Jewish and non-Jewish neighbors of all ages mobilized to create one of the most effective and exceptional examples of mass resistance and escape in modern history. Despite enormous risk, ordinary citizens united against Nazism to save nearly 95% of Denmark's Jewish population. You can learn more and get tickets on our website. Uh, we also hope that you'll join us for our upcoming programs, which you can find on the museum's website at mjhnyc.org slash current events. Um, so please turn off your cell phones and any other noise-making devices for the duration of the program today. Um, we will begin with a keynote from cultural critic Ruth ben Giat, who is also my former professor. Uh, she is the author of Strong Men, How They Rise, Why They Succeed, and How They Fall. Professor ben Giat will discuss projects of national purity by fascist and authoritarian leaders that fueled anti-Semitism throughout history and continue to do so today. Following Professor ben Giat's address, we will move into the poetry reading. Um, I would like to thank Martine Bellin, Ruth Dannon, and Andrew Levy for curating today's event and for all your work on this. Yes, applause, applause, applause. Um, so now I want to thank you all so much for joining us, whether that is here in person with us or virtually. And it is my pleasure to introduce Ruth ben Giat. Thank you. Can you all hear me? It's good. Um, Yes, yes, okay. Is that better? Yes. All right. So thank you, Sydney. Nice to see you in this different context. And thank you to Ruth and Andrew and Martin for having me here. Um, I'm honored to be at this event with so many amazing poets present. I'm a historian. I'm the outlier here. Um, I see history not just as a means of enlightening us about the past, but especially since 2016, where I'm doing a huge amount of public work, um, helping us to cope with and interpret what is happening to us now, um, and warning us about what might happen and what might happen to us, um, because it can happen here, uh, based on patterns of situations and patterns of behavior of autocrats and their enablers. That's my specialty. So, uh, although history is now suspect in many states uh, in the US and around the world, and even criminal or criminalized, um, hooray for history, uh, we need it more than ever. Now, but I'm here today, I accepted this invitation because I have long felt that the most valuable responses to tragedies and oppression actually come from other realms, from creative realms. Uh, film, I wrote a book on uh, film propaganda, um, art, performance, and poetry, of course. And within this, I think that the evocative power of poetry and its quality of linguistic compression, every word a jewel, every word a gift from the poet, means that I think that poetry can actually have a unique role to play in redeeming language. Uh, during situations when uh, language is abused, language is stripped of meaning by authoritarian bombast, or language is soiled, I feel disgusting even saying this, language is demeaned by becoming a, a carrier of hatred and racism. And poetry can express the horror, the awfulness, the intimate devastation that comes with situations of oppression in which people are asked to, to betray themselves. This is an essence of authoritarianism. You are asked to betray yourself. 
and those around you, sometimes your own family, to give up on yourself, to give up hope, to just submit, and give up on your nation as well. And this is what uh, criminals who are in power, uh, like you know, Putin and Xi Jinping and Trump would like to join their ranks again, that's what they uh, want you to do. And right now, Putin is counting on Russians uh, just giving up hope um, to, altogether. So having studied fascism for many years, um, I've spent way too many hours immersed in propaganda. Now, propaganda is not just about getting people to believe um, singular, singular lies. Um, this or that false, falsehood, such as who won the 2020 election. But propaganda is about changing the way people think and feel and changing the associations they make when they hear certain words. It's a, condition, a form of conditioning. Among the most infamous and consequential of those associations comes to us from the language of anti-Semitism, which associates Jew degenerate. Jew, rootless cosmopolitan. Jew, shady operator. Jew, puppet master. And by the way, Steve Bannon, I think it was a year or two ago, actually had a conference in California that was labeled globalist puppet masters. That was the subject of the conference. Um, and of course, most nefariously, tragically, Jew, subhuman. And that gets us to the chilling Nazi phrase, Jews are, quote, lives unworthy of life. So authoritarians turn language into a weapon, as well as emptying key words uh, important in the political life of a nation, such as patriotism, honor, freedom. They empty them of meaning. And we are well on our way in America to what I call the upside down world of authoritarianism. And, uh, and by the way, this talk is, uh, is taken from my book, Strong Men, which goes over 100 years of authoritarianism from Mussolini and Trump is in it. Um, so the upside down world of authoritarianism, where the rule of law gives way to rule by the lawless where freedom is achieved through repression. And every dictator, uh, every coup, they all say they need to do this because uh, they have to free their people from tyranny. Where thugs who assaulted the Capitol on January 6 and defecated in office of members of Congress to show their contempt, their disgust, become patriots. And where, quote, leadership means killing people as Tucker Carlson put it just the other day to justify uh, Putin's killing of Alexei Navalny. Leadership means killing people. Some who have been unfortunate enough to live through criminals taking over their countries have reflected on the parallel colonization and plunder of language. And a famous one from Nazi Germany is Victor Klemperer. Authoritarians create alternate belief systems, alternate worlds, but at root they are nihilists. They despise those, those they govern, and they aim to extinguish not just their critics by putting them in Arctic prisons and leading them to their death, but they aim to extinguish hope and meaning and ideals and purpose and the idea of possibility, the idea that things can change, that you have agency. And this nihilism also affects language. The verbiage authoritarians spew against the backdrop of rallies and spectacles is deadly serious in that it incites violence, it creates a space for violence, it creates motivation for violence. And yet, it also means nothing. It's just a vehicle for the leader's domination, his ego. It's a show, and it's an occasion for mass distraction from the leader's corruption and his crime. Distraction, half of, well, I would say actually 90% of what authoritarians do is to distract us from their corruption and their crime. So 
this, this tragic situation, I'm going to give an example less known than the Nazi German one from fascist Italy. That's my original specialty. This situation is why the young writer Elio Vittorini, in his 1941 novel, Conversation in Sicily, he created a protagonist who was living through a crisis of language at the beginning of the book. His job was typographer, but the words he was supposed to form from individual letters and characters, he was a typesetter for a state-run newspaper, it's fascist Italy. They don't make any sense to him anymore. Quote, it was as if I had nothing to say, nothing to affirm or negate, nothing of my own to stake a claim with. And that's a great quote from the novel, which is about your language has been colonized. You've been robbed of it. The letters don't make sense. The words don't make sense. Now, when Vittorini wrote the book, he wrote it in the late 30s, even though it didn't come out. Um, it was serialized. That was very common. Uh, fascism had entered the imperial anti-Semitic phase, consumed with creating a glorious new order at the side of allied Adolf, Adolf Hitler adding Jews to the roster of state enemies. And xenophobia uh, was rampant. And in fact, there was an absurd and very unpopular campaign of, quote, linguistic autarky. You have to purify the nation. You also have to purify the language. And it banned words of foreign origin, like some of the most popular words, like cocktail, <laughs> chauffeur, and bar. A uh, cocktail, chauffeur, to, like a driver, and bar. The bar being the equivalent of the cafe in Italy. And um, uh, I wrote a, uh, one of my very first scholarly articles was about this. I found this fascinating. And sadly, um, M Giorgio Meloni, the neo-fascist prime minister, is actually trying to do something similar. She's trying to ban English words from circulation today. because She's a fascist, so it makes sense. So back to the novel. This typographer quits his job. He can't do his job. He goes to Sicily. And in the novel, Sicily is a space that's remained untouched or less touched by fascist social engineering schemes. It's a refuge. And there he encounters Italians who are resisting. He meets a guy who goes door to door to sharpen people's knives. Now, that's, that was a real thing. They would, vendors would go around, ambulanti, the um, walking vendors. But these people are sharpening knives. <laughs> Another guy is trying to find a, quote, fresh conscience. So it's not too subtle. It's very interesting that it was published. Um, and there are people who communicate through evasive and hermetic sounds, which Vitturini calls, um, if you know Italian, parole suggellate, sealed words, such as the sounds, actually. Hmm. So their characters, all they say in the book is, hmm, or ah. And these are sounds that the secret police cannot penetrate. They cannot um, do anything. They cannot interpret. So these are sealed words. And that's all you, had, you were left with, in a way, to, to, to start your resistance. He also meets the ghost of his brother, who, who died in a fascist imperial war. And he has a vision. So he's, he's talking to this ghost. And his brother tells him that he is wounded all over again by, quote, every published and spoken word, every millimeter of bronze erected referring to the verbiage, the commemoration of wars undertaken in bad faith. And that's what autocracy, that's what autocrats do. They cause mass loss of life, as with Putin today, which means nothing to them. They don't care about their people. And thus, the rote commemorations, the medals, the certificates you get, they also mean nothing. They're just bureaucratic trash. And everyone knows it after a while. So it's also not surprising that fascism spawned the hermetic movement in poetry, made famous by an early poem by Eugenio Montale called Non chiederci la parola, don't ask us for the word. Now, it was published in 1923, one year after Mussolini took over. 
And he wasn't a dictator yet, but he, it was a period of extreme violence. Um, and the poem ends, don't demand the magic word that opens worlds, some syllable that's distorted and dry as a stick. All we can tell you today is this, colon, what we aren't and what we don't wish for. Now, there's a whole school of theory and about hermetic poetry, but whatever Montale's intention, as a cultural artifact, this is a declaration right after fascism comes in of non-compliance, of non-engagement with the magic words, the visions that Mussolini was a superb sloganeer. He was a superb speaker. It's a refusal just when the right to refuse was being questioned and then soon would be kind of taken away if you wanted to remain out of prison. So I think about the fascist deprivation slash perversion slash defamation of language a lot right now <laughs> with, with Trump and everybody else. Fascism is a crime against language. And those who call out that crime and call out that propaganda leave themselves open to the 21st century autocrats' uh, favorite tool, lawsuits. And they then are the ones who are defaming the leader. And they get sued. Orban, uh, Erdogan uses insult suits. He has sued 20,000 Turks for insulting. It's insane. So I have personal knowledge of this because Trump uh, sued CNN for mil hundreds of millions of dollars for defamation. He was very upset that he was being comp uh, compared to Hitler. And I found out on Twitter that I was cited in this suit. Um, I was the only person, there were like five of us, and all the other people were full-time employees of CNN, like Jake Tapper. Um, and all of them had said something about Hitler, but not me. And I, I'm just, I was just a freelancer. So I'd written an op-ed for CNN that exposed the propaganda techniques of Trump. And the title was, Trump's big lie wouldn't have worked without his thousands of little lies. So they didn't like that. And CNN publishes thousands of op-eds, but this one was the only one <laughs> mentioned. And I, I never compared him to Hitler. I mentioned Orban and other people, but not Hitler. But I focused on the edifice of lies he constructed and his um, perversion of language to con people. And so the judge, uh, who was a Trump appointee, dismissed it. So I didn't have to be deposed. Nothing happened. But it was very interesting. <laughs> so that's the upside down world. You become the defamer. Um, and you have to defend yourself in court. So we're seeing a lot of that right now. Right? So the big lie of Jews as beings unworthy of life depended on thousands of small lies about Jews, told over and over by dogged fascist propagandists to condition people to think differently about Jews. And in fact, most Germans didn't know Jews. Most Italians didn't know Jews. And they rarely thought about them. Maybe they knew from their priest that Jew was a Christ killer. But this was Goebbels' um, uh, mission to bring the Jewish question, to make it, make it a thing, and bring it to a center stage. And this was a key to the, the fact that Germans and Italians didn't know any Jews, most of them, was a key to the success of anti-Semitism. Here's the formula used also by uh, Chinese with Muslims. You pick a group that's tiny or it's a definite minority, a group few people know personally, so that those people, the Jew in this case, can become a monster, a kind of fantastical creature who's everywhere and nowhere, Soros peeping out. There's all these fascist propaganda of like the Jew peeping out. Uh, and when Trump got, made his uh, comment about vermin, he said, they're living like vermin. He wasn't talking about Jews, but other categories. And we have to root them out, because they're everywhere and nowhere, like bugs, right? Like vermin. And 
Jacques Ellul, A-E-L-L-U-L, -L -L, fantastic book from the Cold War era about propaganda, says that propaganda ends where dialogue begins. And so few will know a member of that group targeted. Few will know a Jew and be able to say, but no, a Jew helped me last week. They're not all like that. Or, but no, my best friend in school was a Jew. So there can't be dialogue if there's unfamiliarity, estrangement. And the same logic holds for trans people today ar around the world, because these are standardized talking points. They are a tiny part of a much larger LGBTQ population. They come in for disproportionate vitriol, legislation, demonization, attention. So I'm going to conclude with two warnings. First, authoritarians may single out one group, but they inevitably expand to other groups. And if you think that because you're not an immigrant, you will not be touched if Trump comes back, that is, I think, a delusion. And there's the poem of that first they came for me and I wasn't a socialist, so I didn't care. I'm sorry, first they came for socialists, I didn't care. And then by the time they came for me, there was no one left, right? But we should know something by now. We should have learned something. This 100 years ago. Um, and my research shows that in a century of authoritarianism, it's the same groups who are persecuted over and over again, nomadic peoples, LGBTQ people, ethnic and religious minorities, whatever it looks like in that country, Muslims, and of course, Jews. And the second warning is when the collapse of morals and society happens, and the reign of criminals consolidates. It takes years to regain freedom, and the trauma is immense. So I'm going to end with just a fragment of a poem in, from a book called Poetry of the Resistance, published by this guy, Piero Racchetto, um, a former partisan who, who fought to liberate Italy. It's a really bitter poem. <laughs> And it's not really keeping with my personal ethos. Um, but he earned his bitterness. He had to live for 20 years with Mussolini. The guy was there. Putin has now been there as long as Mussolini, over 20 years. And then he risked his life as a partisan. And sadly, it's also relevant, this phrase I'm going to end with, given the range of criminality of Donald Trump who is the front runner for the GOP nomination and our possible next president. So here's the phrase, every country gets the gangster it deserves. Just a sec. Okay, sound good. Hello, my name is Andrew Levi. I'm happy to welcome you uh, to the event this afternoon entitled A Poetry Reading in Response to Anti-Semitism. In November of 2022, Martin Bellin, Ruth Dannon, and I were changing notes with one another regarding the dangerous uptick in anti-Semitic behavior and anti-Jewish hate speech occurring across the United States and beyond. And during that fall, we were fortunate to connect with Gabriel Sanders, public programs producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. Gabriel embraced our proposal for today's event, and we thank him for setting today in motion. We worked with Gabriel for about a year. Sidney Yeager, who you've met earlier, then stepped into Gabriel's role. Sydney is the person who has produced every element of today's event, and pardon me, and we thank her sincerely. Um, <clears throat> we would also like to acknowledge the work and encouragement of Joshua Mack, Vice President of Marketing, his attention to detail, his constant reminders <laughs> kept everyone on track. In addition, our sincere thanks to all of the museum staff who have made today's event possible 
And finally, our sincerest thanks to Ruth Bin Giat and to today's readers. Poetry returns again and again to the question of why one writes and what, and how the taking in of ethical substance through memory and the process of writing keeps memory active and sets one free. My hope this afternoon is that we each hear something that reminds us, reveals to us, against the backdrop of rising authoritarianism and anti-Semitism, how language reimagined in the way that poetry imagines it can be emancipatory. I know that everyone is eager to hear the amazing poets gathered here today, so I'll close my comments now by reading a passage from Egyptian-born Jewish writer Edmund Javis, The Book of Questions, published in 1963, seven years after his expulsion from Egypt during the Suez Crisis when Jews and other minorities were encouraged or forced to immigrate. This passage resonates with me. I hope it will with you. Given the current climate of anti-Semitism today, Jabba's words speak as clearly as they did 60 years ago. Being Jewish means having to justify your existence. It means having the same sleepless nights in common, suffering the same insults. It means desperately looking for the same buoy, the same helping hand. It means swimming, swimming, swimming in order not to sink. Being Jewish means having the same rings under the eyes, the same skeptical smile, yet the Jew is capable of great enthusiasm. It means facing the forbidden sun and blinking. Being Jewish means learning to move a few yards from the ground, your right to which is challenged. It means not knowing anymore if the earth consists of water or air or oblivion. And now I'd like to introduce Rosebud Ben Oni. Hello, I just wanted to thank Martin, Ruth, and Andrew for putting this together, and also this wonderful museum, which a year ago um, commissioned me to write a poem about the Garden of Stones. And you can find that on their website. I also wrote a short essay um, about why I wrote the poem. And when I was writing the essay in October of last year, we all know what happened in October. And I also um, have an autoimmune condition which affects my balance, vision, like basically the whole shebang. Uh, so I was using a, oh, I'm so sorry, a voice memo app. Um, like I said, I can't see um, very well. I was using a voice memo app to help me communicate with friends and family um, about what was going on. And it was interesting to me that the voice memo app started to rebel against me. Um, and it started making mistakes I felt that were on purpose. So something that, my, um, something that my Garden of Stones poem dealt with was the arrow of time. I have a background in physics. And according to the arrow of time, when an event happens, it cannot unhappen. And er eventually, as dark energy is pushing the universe apart, time itself will then cease. And only then will the arrow of time cease. Well, so will we. Well, I had a response to that. This is called, please excuse my typos, or as voice memo put it, please exude ant tiptoes. <laughs> Holy Moses, to rely on broken goats, no, correct to voice memo. I can't see so well right now. I'm using audio application these days, which I suspect has grown tired of me. So please excuse any typos and wait. Will you please line break where I am broken? I am full of tremors, a broken body and broken eyes, choked up in so much broken sigh, trying to bridge broken friends whom in near blood oaths swear to never speak again. It breaks me, you see, can't you? I can't. No, not so well. And maybe why I went correct 
to perhaps was sent to another world last night. No, I wasn't asleep. I was there and saw so well. I saw many things not unlike myself here, still going on and on about love and the beyond amid the possibility of proton death. How my home planet Earth is no longer in the safety of the Holocene epoch. I fear possible future convexed into avatars, but I was there, a broken Jew, saying my paradox no correct to pardon me, but the new beings I met last night asked me what I was doing rocking in their shoal. They were frightened, though we looked so alike. Where had I come from? From where had I wandered to? Who were my people? I could not answer without gathering all my broken parts, you see, can't you? Being a mixed Jew with autoimmune difficulties, I am made up of many things that never made a complete whole and never wanted to. There's a reason for those like me in some distant future when the Earth's magnetic fields flip and a comet returns to fold as sea levels loom. This is science. This is without question when all the stars begin to wonder, correct, to wander. An earth and sun collide while sitting there with strange and new beings who aren't unlike you in this other world with no signs because all was quiet, no correct, to quite clear. This won't be forever. Yes, it seems there will be an end to things as you know them. The strange stone monuments will erode long before a gamma ray bursts and explodes. I'm trying to tell you both the Hallocene and the Hallocene ending were not by accident. You still have a chance on this very planet to see the future beyond the future. I promise, I have seen it. When the last light goes away, and the last black hole vapors, and all that's left is a sea of photons as universe stretches and cools them to absolute zero. I mean, when time itself is gone, when nothing happens and keeps not happening, even then, I will go on believing in you enough to know there is a way out of the very end, even for those who say they are beyond hope. I know there is so much death in this known universe. And within every plant and planet and tremors and tiptoes and the mistakes and sorrows, you were meant to see all of this, what's already here, how to go on living. It's all around you. The next evolutionary leap, look, look, do you see tomorrow? It's all of you, I do, I know, when the era of time ends, all of you will go on even then. Thank you. That was great, Rosebud. Thank you for having a Garrett Zedek aboard with you today. Um, I'm going to read three short poems sort of shocked how quickly after, <clears throat> sort of shocked how quickly after October 6, there was a coordinated response demanding that the only appropriate way to tell Israel not to do what it was doing or was about to do was to make common cause with Hamas. I know we're not really gonna get political today but I'm still in shock. I guess I thought belief was like a shelf of books to consult in the middle of an argument at dinner, but it's more like an emergency protocol. Everything leads to it. Make pharaohs of the grocery weeds love concrete speeches. Make pharaohs of the breeze off the long-term tide. She smiles all at once. Daylight, sky blue. I trust myself like a dog by the side of the road. I can take the form of imperatives. Numbers are not being bombed. Feeling comes through in writing, and this is it. We stand around in my heart like this. Baruch Hashem. He walks down Eastern Parkway, Talit Katan under his t shirt, the fringe hanging over his Adidas tracksuit, 
makes a fourth stripe. It meets the fourth bar of the tefillin shin halfway. Thank you. So I wrote this poem because my dad told me that he had a Christmas tree um, when he was a kid. And then I published the poem, and my dad's brother said, no, we didn't have a Christmas tree. So I don't know. This is all, this is poetry. Can, who knows what the truth is? Um, <laughs> it's called Kiss Me Santa. On a drive away from Miami, the city my mom and her family moved to in the 40s, I spot a cumulus tableau, a long, thin cloud that looks exactly like Santa Claus on a sled. Even his reindeer are in cloud form, mushing ahead. And so, from the rental car window, I snap a cell picture of it. And at that moment, I can hear my now dead mom cackling at my excitement. Not very Jewish, she laughs at me. Not very Jewish, I keep hearing. Mom never liked going to synagogue or studying Torah or Talmud, but she enjoyed laughing when she heard of other Jewish families who had Christmas trees and whose kids believed in Santa. Like she'd joke about Jews with tattoos, even though she loved eating buttered lobster. <laughs> Our people, she'd say, we don't do that. Our people. My father was the one who would try to find our family a synagogue, somewhere that would be comfortable for us non-Hebrew-speaking, quasi-atheist Jews. He was the one who dragged us to the Zen Buddhist house for Rosh Hashanah, or the Havara in Albuquerque, where a white-robed rabbi chanted in Aramaic with a Navajo drum. Still, my father would have loved for us to have a Christmas tree like he had in his own childhood home, like all the other Jewish families he grew up with had in what was then called Midwood, but now has other fancier names like Kensington or Fisk Terrace. Secretly, I think mom would have, might have loved Santa too. What's not to love about round bellies, long white beards, and endless plates of homemade cookies? Who doesn't love the laughter that follows one's own dumb jokes? That laughter itself is very Jewish, isn't it? If Santa had visited us, I bet Mom would have given her pieces of her famous overstuffed raisin walnut apricot rugula called Mock Strudel in the early 60s cookbook. And I'm certain that she would have been awake when Santa arrived, because 3 AM? That was her favorite time to be alive, her time away from me and dad and everyone who wanted her to listen to them or have her do stuff. When she was alone at 3 a.m. in the amber-stained reading glass lit half dark in her wood-paneled den in our Bronx lit level, would mom have poured Santa a glass of Dr. Brown's diet cherry soda? Together would they have relished the snap of a thick, sour dill. Hello. Uh, this is from my book, V Imp, which is from, I think, 2002. And I wrote this in September 2001, so you can kind of guess what it was addressing. It's sort of my all-purpose, human-made disaster poem. The end of greed, imperialism, opportunism, and terrorism. Mule and ostrich took a walk in the veil of tears. Their minds were elsewhere. Tread lightly and accurately, ostrich reminded Mule. Mule nodded solemnly. 
The hoi polloi stormed around them, rending their garments. Brooks Brothers suits, red suspenders, taluses, green headdresses, burkas. Everyone was spewing so much vital fluid that their faces, hands, and chests had gone all viscous. No one had a clue, said Mule, lowering his head and pawing at the rubble, his mane and eyelashes thick with white dust. I feel so mournful. Don't you still want to take the language somewhere else, Ostrich asked, swerving his head around to stare cross-eyed at Mule. Of course I do, sighed Mule. I'm a beast of burden. That's all I know how to do. But right now, I wish we had hands so we could hold hands. That's liberal humanism, said Ostrich, looking ruefully at his leathery talons and Mule's splayed, yellowing hooves. So, said Mule, his lip quivering. They walked on past a couple of conflicting ideologies who were tugging at a yellow-green rope made of glass. Look, said Ostrich, I see some flowering anthrax trees over there. Let's go rest a while beneath them. They found a quiet spot in between some twisted metal, some intestines, and a penis attached to part of a leg. The anthrax flowers hung sweet and heavy over their heads like tubas. Mule began crying and braying. Why are you crying? Ostrich asked quietly. The pointed tip at the bottom of a heart is a reservoir for blood and fear. No, the pointed tip at the bottom of a heart is a reservoir for blood and fire. The hills are alive with the sound of maniacs. There has never been a brighter, more toothless day. Ostrich? asked Mule. Yes. Do you love this world? 1,500 babies, their skins red and glistening, crawled past, crying for their parents. Ostrich watched the infantile procession with his huge, confused-looking eyes. Maple, persimmons, hoop games, balalaikas, fertile loam, swordfish, suspension bridges, tapenade, marbleized end papers, camellias, sand dunes with dune grass to lie down in, rose hips, raucous schoolyards, highly sensitive instruments, swirls of algae, little yellow pills, public and private transportation, chickadees, dry leaves, my own gorgeous plumes. Yes, no, I don't fucking know. He propped his head between mule's downy ears. Together, they looked out at the glowy horizon where ignorant armies were clashing by night. This is just an allegory, right, Ostrich? A huge needle pricked the top of the sky and blood started to pour out, first red, then blossoming gray, finally staining the whole sky a sulfur yellow. Yes, my dear mule, this is only, this is only, only ya da di da da di da da di da da la elaha el allahu la elaha Cue the morning doves. This is an amazing, uh, amazing museum, amazing even afternoon. Uh, I am thankful to be part of this. I don't really have a specific poem about anti-Semitism, but I have plenty to say about race and other things in America, so I'm going to do that. So why? I was thinking about uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Getz, uh, I just say her name wrong. She was so wonderful. 
I want to say Dr. Ruth, okay. <laughs> it was just the thing about resistance and why are people so prepared to hear lies? And I keep thinking about that. And so I looked up all these poems I've written, and one is called My Matthew Shepherd Poem, uh, which was written before 2000, obviously, but says a lot about America. My Matthew Shepherd poem. My students are rightfully spooked. Someone their age was left to perish because he preferred the company of men. My mother tells me of seeing a man lynch back in the 30s in Arkansas, not far from where I grew up and grew away in the 60s. What I know about America is that hatred crawls through the culture like the cracks in the San Andreas Fault. Edifices are built to withstand the inevitable quakes, but the quake grows stronger. Whatever we dream harmony or reasonable tolerance is destroyed in the wake of men drinking and killing, their blood lusted laughter howling through the night, a black man in Texas, a white man in Wyoming, a doctor at his window about to eat dinner with his family, a nurse on her way to work at a clinic. The playing field is not level. In fact, there is no playing field. There are men enraged by change and women bitter about it, and people say gay, black, Latino, Chinese, Japanese, Arab, or Jewish to blame, always to blame. The men in their same wool suits and striped ties give her political correctness, freedom and fairness, and fuck you every time they claim that these are acts of individuals, not of society. Each act alone represents singular aberrant behavior like murder, I can hear them say, I mean, they actually lynched that boy, even as they call this one faggot and that one nigger, and they really, really want women compliant and girlish or sexless and mothering. And if this seems like male bashing, so be it. If the dress shoe fits, may it pinch like hell. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. As witness to these dark times, let me open with a poem by Paul Celan in my translation, addressing that vengeful Godhead common to our three monotheistic disaster modes. Tenebrae, we are near, Lord, near and graspable. Grasped already, Lord clawed into each other as if each of our bodies was your body, Lord. Pray, Lord, pray to us. We are near. Wind bent, we went there. We went there to bend down over crater and mar. To the trough we went, Lord. It was blood. It was what you spilled, Lord. It shone. It cast your image into our eyes, Lord. Eyes and mouth gape so open and empty, Lord. We have drunk, Lord. The blood and the image that was in the blood, Lord. Pray, Lord, we are near. In January 1934, two months after his bar mitzvah, the 14-year-old Paul Celan wrote to his aunt Minna, who had recently emigrated to Palestine. He explained why he had been ranked second in class and not first by citing his, quote, belonging to the Jewish branch of the Semitic race, end of quote. The other branch is, of course, the Arab branch, which makes the accusations of anti-Semitism all the way to today more complex than both extremist simplifications thereof. The killing has to stop on both sides. 
Let me close with a poem by the poet Hiba Abanada, translated by Huda Faridin. Hida Abunada was killed in her home in the Gaza Strip by an Israeli airstrike on October 20th, 23, at age 32. Got it. Not just passing. Yesterday, a star said to the little light in my heart, we are not just transients passing. Do not die. Beneath this glow, some wanderers go on walking. You were first created out of love, so carry nothing but love to those who are trembling. One day, all gardens sprouted from our names, from what re remained of hearts yearning. And since it came of age, this ancient language has taught us how to heal others with our longing, how to be a heavenly seam sent to relax their tightening lungs, a welcome sigh, a gasp of oxygen. Softly, we pass over wounds like purposeful gauze, a hint of relief, an aspirin. Oh, little light in me, don't die, even if all the galaxies of the world close in. Oh, little light in me, say, enter my heart in peace. All of you, come in. What a great lineup. Thank you, everyone, for having me here today. This piece is called This Page is an Occupied Territory. Three circuits, sanctuary, synchronies, synchronies, anachronies, iniquities, occupado, occupato, occupare, occupat, occupe. This page is an occupied territory of transidiomatic traditions, collisions, divisions, a code meshing of illegalities, legalities, vortices, indices, travesties, backwards, watchwords, passwords, loan words. This page is a war zone, a non-homogenous environment of shifting congruence, a confluence, a flexible lexicon, scissions, visions, revisions, invasions imprinted on fleshy fibers, cotton weaves, wood, rice, wheat, straw, flax, silk skin, circuits, contracts, discords, accords imprinted in the proxy taught thought troughs, inhabitable palimpsest of roughed up recombinant itinerant rig torque contorts and is making you its co-host. This page has already been occupied, coated with resistance, obscenity, and abandon and drowning in the stained refrain of desolate lines, linen, lignin aligned in impossible sobs, ghosts, lips, slips, silk and spun, shred, shroud, shard, shells, shudder, shudder, stutters, occupied like this seat, wall, street, cell, seabed, sky of orbitable debris, data, data, occupied by these letters, this night of naked upheaval, archaic arcs, inserts, curse, course, course, curse, discoursing, whispers, slaughters, occupied with sleep, slake, stake, strap, sod, squalor, cinders, abscess, obstinate dominance, Dominance, dissonance, imminence, impermanence, all porous and tormented between peace, posits, paucity, opacity, prosities, porosity, parts, press, vex, lex, lax, pax, pax, of supple madness in the rasp of today. This page is a war zone, a corazon of residual traces, tensions, triggers of elaborate aberrant 
collabor collaboratives laboring in plots, plans, protests, plans, plagues, graves, grass, grapple, groans, gropes. This page is a war zone, and it's been so occupied in shadows, marrow, screams, scales, fails, folds, flux, forms, peripheries, referees, reveries, rivalries, fertile, fertile, free zone, furl fumes, flues, fields, fleas in the porous aura of dead aporia pulsing in the rivering seas, sticky toxicity of remodulated memory. Thanks. Hello. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of this event for bringing us all together and all these great readers and all of you for coming. And I'd like to dedicate my section to the memory of my grandmother, Ella Marion, who was born in Bialystok in what was then Russia and is now part of Poland. She came here in about 1920 with her family and um, was an actress on the Yiddish stage, um, raised a family. And then after the war, she uh, went to Europe to, she was, knew several languages and she worked as an interpreter, uh, working with displaced persons. Um, later in her life, she lived upstate and she had a small movie theater. She always loved theater and, and movies and you know the arts. And, um, I have, happen to have her in her papers documentation. She kept these um, newspaper articles that documented these anti-Semitic um, occasions that would occur in her theater where people would come and shout out anti-Semitic slurs. Um, she never talked about that or about the Holocaust, although I read in, um, in Jonah Goldberg's Hitler's willing executioners that the Jews of Bialystok were all put into, you know, herded into their synagogue and the synagogue was set on fire. Um, so, you know, with all that history, when I got to know her, she was this person who was amazingly committed to life and poetry. When she found out I was writing poetry, she got very excited. Oh, she was also a fan of Fidel's, and she wrote this um, the lyrics to this song about Fidel Castro and asked me to set it to music, which I tried to do. Um, you know, and, and just one thing I'll always remember that she told me, she said, you know, if you find somebody you love and who loves you, stick to that person. So I feel like finding um, the will to live in the face of you know, any kind of prejudice or the horrors that go along with it is really uh, difficult and pretty heroic. Um, so having said that, I'm gonna read two poems. Once in a field of flowers, they sit in a field surrounded by daffodils, smiling, looking, tumbling. Ostensibly, they are posing, but in effect, they are being nature as it affects their being together in this moment of their youth together. In that, they are primal reminders of how we animals are all together in a moment before it gets taken away or we choose to move from it. But now, we feel a vibration from the earth we are sitting on it. You can see Earth, and one is upside down. His head touches Earth. Waist bridges up. How can everyone be the same age? Their long hair of their time, their jeans and t-shirts, symbols of an age. Uncertainty caught there a moment ago. 43 years, suddenly nothing. That perfect time they are together. Can they gather that? Make something from it, someone? Take time to be free from it? At the beach, 
Light worked all day on the mountain. The day takes a certain effect on faces. By the end, colored by day's affections, they take on a specific knowledge. Different kinds of bodies all day, they do not leave their owners. The body during the day is worked. By night, it is allowed to relax. The sun has a force that feels endless. Though life does not, the sun goes eventually behind the mountain. Colors become surprisingly bright. The mountain was the thing that all day seemed monstrous, beautifully imposing, but now is flat, as all time is suddenly none. I, I'm going to read two short poems. <clears throat> Ritual. At night, I undress, remove my shirt, pants, socks, underwear, stand bereft at the pit's edge. Naked, I wait for the stroke, then put on my shorts to sleep, slip beneath the sheet, and lie back at peace. Sunday morning in Krakow, Krakow. A train ride back from Auschwitz last evening where we stood within walls. We listened how the weakest slept on the bottom tier in the mud, yet the top tier was really no better in cold Polish winter under a roof that let in snow. Just then, heavy rain held us up, kept us to wait in the darkness. Of course, there were horrors I will not name. Too late. Morning's bells are full of grief I take with my tea. Thank you. Many thanks again to Ruth and Andrew and Martine and all the other readers and everybody in the audience here today. Uh, the poem I'm going to read from my new book, Frank Dark, and also thanks to the Museum of Jewish Heritage, of course, uh, is entitled <laughs> The Hitlerian Spring. And um, this poem is my creative English adaptation of a piece by Montale, a, po a poet whom uh, Ruth ben Giet already introduced at the opening to this event. Only this poem anticipates the liberation of Italy from fascism. A couple of footnotes. Uh, the addressee is named Kletia or Kleiti in Greek. That's the sunflower woman in Greek mythology. Montale is Beatrice or beloved, who was Irma Brandeis, a glamorous Jewish American Dante scholar who escaped persecution and death by fleeing to the United States. In the opening of the poem, we have the image of uh, mayflies swirling about associated with spring, but they resemble snow. And one more footnote, in the middle of the poem, the speaker recalls the festival of San Giovanni, which was the last time he um, was able to see Clizia uh, Irma. And uh, that was because Hitler had come to Florence to meet Mussolini. And right after that meeting, uh, fascism took a much more aggressive turn toward anti-Semitism, and the laws changed. At the opening of the poem, the infernal messenger is obviously Hitler. And at the close of the poem, uh, the warlocks are Mussolini and his henchmen. The Hitlerian Spring. A thick fog of maddened mayflies swirls around dirty lamps and over the parapets. Underfoot, they form a shroud of crackling sugar. 
Spring slowly frees the nocturnal frost from caverns, ghosted gardens extending from Mayano to these shores. Up the street, an infernal messenger just flew by, flanked by curdling cries of hail, concealed as the Wagnerian orchestra pit at one of his mad midnight rallies, a mystical gulf lit up and flagged with mangled crosses, just embraced him, gulped him down. This evening, all the shop windows are shuttered, Though even these are armed with cannons and little military toys, a man has bolted his gate. He is a friendly butcher who would garland the muzzles of slaughtered goats with grapes. Easter rite for those still unaware that the blood has utterly changed. Shattered wings and larvae on the banks. The water goes on chewing at the shoreline. Everything we had was all for nothing then, Clizia. The Roman candles at the San Giovanni festival slowly whitening out the horizon and our pledges and lingering goodbyes binding as a baptism in the mournful presence of the horde. Though a budding comet rayed the air distilling on the ice and the rivers of your new world shores, the angels of Tobias the seven, yes, the seed of the future and the heliotrope unfolding from your palms, all scorched, sucked dry by this pollen that hisses fire and bites with the teeth of a blizzard. No one is blameless anymore. This ulcerated spring is festive, even if it freezes all this death in death. Look again, up there, Clizia, lies your destiny. You who keep love unaltered in its alteration until the blind sun you carry inside can be dazzle the other and explode in him for all or for you at least. Maybe the sirens, the pealing bells that saluted warlocks at their Sabbath are already dissolving in the celestial sound that unleashed descends and conquers with the breath of a dawn that tomorrow may rise again for all. Bleached, of course, but please without more swarms of gnawing terror in the parched river bottoms of the South. Thank you. I just want to thank all the organizers and the Museum of Jewish History for this beautiful reading and the opportunity to hear all this great poetry. This is called I Called My Home Memory for the Women of Ukraine, Israel, and Palestine and all women survivors of war. I called my home memory because before I was born, ancestral voices instructed me to lay down my wings, go to sleep in the sea, and rise in the land of my mother. Strong underground waters brought me to her. My first step was an anchor. Her people were barbarians of distant origin, moved by pursuit through hostile lands. Their name for themselves was noble, through mischance and malice, it came to mean slave. Centuries ago, they raised a singing stone against the sky so that hundreds of years later, it might beckon them back across the breath bridge they called memory. My mother said I bore the mark of a mysterious incandescence, which meant someday I would gather our people to heaven. She told me heaven and home were the same, so I called my heaven memory. And when our destroyer appeared, we swept our tears through the gutters to clean the smell of their metals from our streets. It was a sacrament to listen to the rushing flood in the cold, muddy dusk. The flood moved our souls smoothly between the billboards and the lakes, the dead and the living. We called the flood memory. 
Like a blood influxion positioned between my shoulder blades and lungs, it spread through my skin and under my oxygen. My veins became inroads, my lungs telephones, my aorta a radio. More whirlwind than water, it carried me. And what I didn't know, memory knew. And where I flowed, memory had always been. The stone my ancestors raised called out through my skin and across the breath bridge and into every kitchen. The wings I'd laid, I'd laid down appeared on the shoulders of those who rose above the flood, above death. Their forms shone bright against the sky, ringed with light. I watched from the ground. Ancestral spirits changed my flood feet to earth feet for their own reasons. When the flood receded, all was quiet. Not a soul remained except for me. I am here and I am alone, but I know memory will bring me home. And so I call my memory home. And um, I'm just going to read one more. This is called In the Fifth Infinity. We were born having been born before. The time of exquisite arrival had passed, so we lived in the light that persisted from zeniths to shapeless oblivions, our hands damped with bracken. We damped our hands, having damped them before. Our northeasterly pleats squeezed mountains from the south for the sake of clean sheets, good sleeping weather, and lattices of wisteria on the corners. What did it mean to die wandering, our bags packed for catastrophe? We died, having died before. But we survived the circumscribing ambient, the damped hands, having survived before. Thanks. Thank you all for being here. I thank the organizers for inviting me to add to this soundtrack of the battle against hatred and plain old meanness. And because I regard poetry as both timely and timeless, I would like to read from a book of mine titled Nine East that came out in 2013. Last analysis. Today is not your day. If you fall, fall hard. Why I go for the meal care bosom? Unpack your bag before you begin to unpack mine. Ship tenderness, the bankrupt grape. I can be rid of rebellion, but it is love that pulls me here. Labyrinth, rain on asphalt. I live in a traffic jam. I live in a blank piece of paper. The ship's first glance at Martini's fine front runners. Wing over. These orderings shall never run out. This proposal grows bolder. I want to finger your inner potential. These teeth on harbor sentences. I wouldn't try if I didn't feel I could outdo the sticks of dynamite. Bend this bar, regrease the semi-moon, walk with waves. I thought love's devilry without a stingy palais. Between two tomorrows, a white herb. Inhaled, walked, fell, got his soul overdressed. Some people sell gray stock by this patch of dawn. Butter the roost, power play in a rut. There is nothing to do but unweave the web and imbroglio fits into my temple. Maybe you ask too much of my composure. How dare you say war at those people? I say it, I repeat it, 
count the missing bodies, houses after strapping. There is no way simply to copy the blue bone and leave it at that. You occupy me further than this message from the bailiff. After all, we can't play it safe. The scandal has occurred. No nouns left standing. Hose, tights, breastbone. It takes practice here to bound down the border. Should I pull away because your lips are fatter than mine? This exile is on the wane. The road forgot you. Midsummer forgot you. Polenta forgot you. You fled from the roof on a helicopter. The crooks rioted. A triple ball withered. Your guards deserted you. They were so obstinately bent on choosing potage. Claw track of a reap. Clockwork up to gunpoint. Thank you. Um, this uh, poem is dedicated to Joseph Ventura. Uh, now? Okay, thanks. I was telling you that this poem is dedicated to poet Joseph Ventura. The title of the poem is Tanais. Tanais is the name of the ship bombed by a British submarine on June 9, 1944, where the entire Jewish population of Crete was being transported to the German concentration camps. Poet Joseph Ventura, then six, year old, six years old, was saved by Athena Vartakakis from bombing that ship on which 88 Cretan Jewish children and some 300 adults were to die. Many crew members managed to survive. The Jewish prisoners did not because they were chained. I met poet Joseph Ventura at the Voaviv Poetry Festival in Set in 2017. He is today one of the few survivors from the Jewish community of Crete. Now the poem. That child you wear, Joseph, your candor, under that woman's safeguard, who knew how to prevent, to shield you, you and her, safe from that black boat, that other black, ill-fated steed of Troy. Did someone tell her then, or whisper to her ear, to Athena, nor invade her name? Keep him, woman, from the fierceness of the good ones. Keep yourself and keep him from the friendly fire. Sometimes tell me, Joseph, or maybe I just want to believe it, that you and she, your candor and her prudence, her restraint and your calm, and that auspicious fate that lodges in your name, somehow, even if improbable, keep us, you and all of us, from the next explorer, but perhaps I'm wrong. Hello, thanks for your attention. Limbo. Today in the taxi, driving a commercial real estate type from 43rd and Madison to 57th and Park, I said, would you prefer to go at Madison or Park? He said, it doesn't matter. Either way, we're fucked. <laughs> and it was true when a black pair of birds burst from the building like fulfillment. I, too, seek to weave a memory from foam, 
a black bottle opener and the blackest bottle in the flow of liquids. You cannot know it, you can see it. General Beadle Smith reported that in April 1945, when they liberated Buchenwald, he witnessed, quote, General Eisenhower go to the opposite side of the road and vomit. From a distance, I saw Patton bend over, holding his head with one hand and his abdomen with the other. I too became sick. When the oncoming headlights are too bright, it is said you should look to the side at the lines on the road. You would stop yourself from being blinded and stop yourself to imagine the road ahead unstrung and the rubber against it. Purple Death. Tonight in the taxi, I knew the silence in the car with its gray and stain-proof velour that absorbed the silence on the other side of the windshield. The city vibrated and pushed the air up or down as wind among the petals. I thought of insects who might seek yellow pollen to stave off their own destruction. Kafka saw butterflies as great opened out books of magic. It's possible, but not now, that the Lord will open the door and suck the noise out of the car with her tongue. It's possible for her, but she won't do it now. She'll be happy if one day there were no sounds attached to words and no ears to hear them. Thanks. Hello, thank you for being here. Thank you to the organizers for uh, making this possible today. I'm going to read two poems from my book, Aunt Bird, um, which is a book-length elegy to my and about my aunt, uh, Fega, Yiddish for bird. Um, she was murdered by the Nazis during the Holocaust. She was murdered in the Krakow ghetto, and I knew very little about her. The first poem I'll read is called, I Have Nothing to See Her With. I have nothing to see her with. My aunt, whose life is a ripped page. Does she suckle on wind, forage among roots, rummage near clawed feet, drink handfuls of rain. The second poem I'll read, um, I imagine my aunt describing the, the crack of ghetto. It's called Aunt Bird Recalls the Ladder of the Righteous She Observed During the War. Along the ladder of the righteous, on the rungs between evil and good, a dusk of pigeons smeared the sky, and the language of joy was penniless, a vagrant. God was a runaway child who ate the earth with a spoon and licked the goose flesh of our crowded room so full our shadows couldn't lie down, standing for weeks around a candle's nervous bird of light. Along the ladder of the righteous on the rungs between evil and good, we threaded worry through the eyes of needles. Chana rubbed smuggled perfume on her wrists, the scent of poppies even on her breath. Yaakov printed letters of the alphabet on, the, on his palm with a lump of coal and for each character he remembered, he mouthed a gun's hollow boom. Leah mistook stones for beans. She stirred them in a pot. And we wondered if the sky would stop. Along the ladder of the righteous on the rungs between evil and good, prisoners scratched their names with their fingernails on detention center walls, while customers on city streets haggled for marzipan and chocolate, dumplings and live geese, streets 
where people dissolved like sugar cubes on the tongues of rain. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I will read. Can you hear me? Yeah. I will read two not new poems and one I wrote a few days ago. Uh, they broke, and they broke the Jews of 962, this is from the book nine. Uh, they broke the Jews, they broke his spirit and he wrote about it. Uh, it's about my father. Uh, my mother was more of a mystery to me. European Jews miraculously surviving the Nazi persecution became communists. Not all, but many had nowhere else to turn until the tide turned and the disillusionment came about, the awakening that turned so many against the party and turned their beliefs upside down and inside out. Overnight, they went from one extreme to the other. Shame, embarrassment, humiliation, contradictions, more uncertainties for the Jews. And this is 960. I, I, I wasn't too fit. Uh, I wasn't even told we were Jewish until later. Because Europeans couldn't take any chances in those days. I was born in Cannes, in hiding, in fear. After the war, my mother became a radio producer. I listened to her live broadcasts alone after school. Alone, I listened to my mother on the radio. You might say I was being neglected a bit. I became someone who had to grow up fast, only later to shrink herself like Alice to fit. <laughs> and this is from three days ago. Uh, you have anti-Semitism. You have surfaces, you will get dust. You have neurons, you'll get thoughts. If you go for an invigorating swim, you will get wet. That is guaranteed. Suddenly, suddenly, you are on the subway again, looking out the window, not seeing much. Where there are Jews, there is anti-Semitism. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for organizing this. Um, it's great to, as you mentioned before, to bring humanity back to language. Um, two poems. These are new. Regime. Red ant, black ant, 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 different. Quit texts are anti-fisher reality. I am asking about form and foam and surface and mass and how people decide who listens already assembled, who fishers, who in their previous seeking let yours find theirs, who is empty, who has room. Who gave you your hand to leave it alone? Who sat on the land and let you roam? Who in one life gave you one heart to say it was none? Who was the solder to realm in your river? Who are the people doing at the same time impossible immensity? Who interjects re reality with emblems? Slide reality, sword infinity, word reality, a poet's agility to enter agility. Who is anti-possible? Who loosened your ears and gave you rust? 
I am asking about fear and decision and the gifting of Fisher. Mannequin ectophan, stick tuck inker, man ek, man s, nan ek, man ecstatic surfaces to explain how I got here how your life sustains philosophy over the course of what propels deep fake. Who gave you deep fear as reality? Quit as reality. Who quilted kick? These quick texts are reality. Loosely associated bits of stream. Paltry accomplishments, a list in the vacuum, taking surprise out of the ether. Who gave you fear as a hardship to follow? Who is the scream and the nothing you own and the nothing you choose, cut off from the world and the difference you own? I am asking what happens to the letters unwritten by the fingers unswiped across earth. Who gave you paper and ink and things that used to say what was written and what was holding? Who studied infraction to always conform to the given? Grindle the doorstop instead. Gully the barnacle, as Tardos would say. Shuck it, your cufflink is showing. Irrelevant tucks, golding the cufflink. Who drained the elegies out of your nighttime? Glint affirmation for pleasure, you're ending your choice. Who gave you patterns to continue? There is no answer to the patterns we witness. Who gave you witness and called it truth? I am screaming my way out of an empty room. I am subverting the poetic form to understand how there is nothing to understand. Who gave you one way to call the right way when the exit clearly marked no way? Does fear have light in the anti-possible? I am asking about an empty poem that doesn't know how to finish. Who gave you an empty room to ghost against? Who fishers? Who lives? Thank you. So uh, for all who would like to join in right now, let's take a moment of silence for peace in the world in the harmony of all beings. Thank you, thank you. Um, this is the best poetry reading I've ever been to. Uh, <laughs> let's have a round, final round of applause for all the poets, please. <laughs> and now, Let's mingle. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>